بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين الحديث السادس عشر عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله أن رجلا قال للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أوصني قال لا تغضب فردد مرارا قال لا تغضب رواه البخاري أبو هريرة reports that a man Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه reports that a man he came to the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام and he said to him O Prophet of Allah advise me give me some advice the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said do not get angry the man repeated his, his question a few times and the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام answered every single time the exact same way لا تغضب do not get angry this hadith was reported by Al-Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi. Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, we have reached hadith number 16 in the collection of 40 of Al-Imam Al-Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi. And insha'Allah ta'ala, we'll get right into today's hadith. It's a hadith that is a testimony to the quality of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being jawami'ul kalim. He speaks very less, but his the meaning behind his speech is huge. Huge implications behind what he says. And this hadith in itself, literally, if we actually look at this hadith, the only thing the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith is, لا تغضب. It's a command of prohibition. Do not get angry. لا تغضب. So that's all the hadith is. So if you know this phrase of لا تغضب, you have memorized the hadith. It's that easy. So simple. But such a, such a deep and profound meaning. So this hadith, as I mentioned in the previous lessons, Imam Nawi rahmatullahi alayhi, he brings a, a narration or he brings a statement from the Imam of the Malikiyah in Morocco during his time. Imam Nawi mentions the statement of this man. His name was Abu Muhammad or Abdullah ibn Abi Zaid. He said that there are four hadith there's four hadith in which the akhlaq and adab and the etiquettes and manners and good qualities and characteristics could be summarized in. There's four hadith. So then he mentions these hadith. One of those hadith are this hadith we're doing today, la taghlab. We mentioned these hadith last week. The second hadith is the hadith, alhamdulillah, the beautiful thing is we've, we've covered every single one of these hadith so far. The second hadith is the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam is instructing everybody to mind your own business. Min husnil Islam al mar'i tarkuhu ma la ya'ni. Letting go of those things that do not concern you. This is the second hadith. The third hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that is a, a asl and a principle of good qualities and ethics is la yu'minu ahadukum hatta yuhibbu li akhihi ma yuhibbu li nafsi. You will never be a true believer until you love for your brother what you love for this year yourself. The concept of giving people preference, ithar, we spoke about. So, alhamdulillah, we have covered every single one of these. So now getting right into the hadith, this hadith is a very, very beautiful narration. And from this narration, we see that the Prophet wasallam. It's possible that this hadith occurred more than once. It's, pro it's possible that this incident occurred more than one time. The Prophet wasallam advising his companions at different times to not get angry and not get upset. And what is, what is this based on? Well, it's based on different things. One being that there are different companions who narrated this hadith. And in some of these narrations, the companions say that I asked the Prophet In other narrations, it says a man asked the Prophet In other narrations, it's a woman who asked the Prophet So there's a difference in opinion to who asked this question. Who is this person who came to the Prophet to ask him to say, uh, give me some advice or grant me some advice. Those, so some of those op options and opinions are one of them being Abu Darda Some people say that the questioner was Abu Darda radiallahu anhu. 
Others say it was a person by the name of Jariyat ibn Qudama. Others say it was Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma. Regardless, there's an ikhtilaf to who asked the question. So these were some of the, some of the uh, opinions of the great ulama of the past. This hadith has also been reported by Imam Tirmidhi, Imam Tabarani, and Imam ibn Abid Dunya with slight different wordings. Some of the wordings speak about somebody coming to ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, عَلِّمْنِي عَمَلًا عَلِّمْنِي عَمَلًا يُقَرِّبُنِي إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ وَيُبْعِدُنِي أَوْ يُبَاعِدْنِي فِنْ إِلَى النَّارِ A person coming to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asking him, saying, teach me about an amal, teach me about something, teach me something that will bring me close to Jannah and that will keep me very, very far away from Jahannam. So then the Prophet ﷺ, he answered by saying, لا تغضب ولك الجنة Do not get angry, Jannah will be for you. You will have Jannah. Just control your anger. So slight different variations in wordings. And in another narration, it, it says, where دلني على عمل يدخلني الجنة ولا تكثر عليه where the person came to the Prophet ﷺ and saying, saying, Ya Rasulullah, teach me an action that will easily enter me into Jannah, but make it very concise. Don't make it too long, because I want to memorize what you're saying. Keep it very short and simple. So again, the Prophet ﷺ answered, La تغلط. Do not get angry. So subhanAllah, we see that this is a, this concept of controlling one's anger is a, is a key to many great things. One of them being Jannah. So, why such a big warning for anger? Why? So, one Sahabi, radiallahu anhu, Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, rahmatullahi alayhi, he mentions this in his, in his book. He says that this Sahabi, he says, إِنَّ الْغَضَبَ جِمَاعُ الشَّرِّ كُلِّ Anger is something that brings all evils together. From anger, many other things could, could come and could, could happen. Anger is just the first step, and from anger, things can get out of control. This is one of the reasons why the Prophet والسلام, or why anger has such a huge, uh, such huge warnings and wa'eeds. Abdullah ibn Mubarak, rahmatullahi alayhi, he says something beautiful. Somebody asked him, he's, they said, one of his students asked, saying, Ijma'alana husnal khuluqi fi kalima. He says, a student asked him, Ya Abdullah, Ya Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Bring together husnul khuluq. Bring together good qualities and good character and good mannerisms in one phrase. Tell me one phrase that, that is encompassing of all good qualities and all good characteristics. And Abdullah ibn Mubarak, rahmatullahi alayhi, he said, Tarkul ghadab. Letting go of anger. Letting go of hatred. Letting go of anger. Not having anger inside your heart. Not holding grudges against people. Letting go of that. If you do this, this is, a, this is something that encompasses all khayr and all types of good akhlaq and good qualities. So, and another, another great alim of the past, again mentioned in the book of Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, rahmatullahi alayhi, he says, Al-ghadabu miftahu kulli sharr. Anger is the key or the root of all evil. So, again, this is why anger has been given so much emphasis and so much, uh, so much warning to stay away from. And now we're going to get into the details of, is it anger as a whole we should stay away from? Or is it the reaction of how we react when we get angry? There's a difference. One is, you know, the, the, this, this prohibition is very, very general. La, la taghbab. Do not get angry. So somebody, they can translate it literally and they can think that, so what? I'm not ever, to get, I'm not ever allowed to get angry ever? Like no matter what happens? This is not the case. So Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, rahmatullahi alayhi, he breaks it down. He says that, look, the meaning of this hadith is what? لا تعمل بمقتضى الغضب Do not do actions, do not act with regards to how your anger is pushing you towards do something. Think before you act. Do not act with your anger. Do not make a decision while being angry. This is what the hadith is saying. It's not saying you're not ever allowed to be angry. Why? Because... This is the thing, Imam, Imam Nawi rahmatullahi alayhi, he explains, and I'll give some examples after. He says, لَيْسَ النَّهْيُ رَاجِعًا إِلَىٰ نَفْسِ الْغَضَبِ The prohibition here is not talking about anger itself, saying don't ever get angry. That's not the prohibition. He goes and he says, لِأَنَّهُ مِنْ طِبَاعِ الْبَشَرِ Because anger 
is from the natural disposition of how human beings were created. Human beings are naturally gonna, all, gonna, gonna naturally have anger inside them. They're naturally gonna have that emotion inside them. That's how human beings were created. And then he goes and he says, وَلَا يُمْكِنُ الْإِنسَانُ دَفْعُهُ It's impossible for a human being, it's impossible for a human being to never get angry. You're gonna get angry. You're gonna get angry. But now the nahi and prohibition is what? How you react when you do get angry. Okay? So this is where the prohibition is coming in. Because, you know, we, we can't always control how we feel inside, but we can control our reaction to that feeling. And everyone has their buttons. People say, you know, don't push my buttons, don't push the... Everyone has, you know, their buttons inside them, or everyone has those things inside them that if someone violates or if someone does go against or whatever it is, they'll get upset. Naturally. Okay? So now, what is anger? You know, we're going to get into examples after where the Prophet ﷺ portrayed his anger. The Prophet ﷺ, he got angry as well. So the famous dictionary, Taj al-Urus. Taj al-Urus, literally, it means the uh, Taj, the, the, uh, the crown of the, of the Urus, of the bride. This is what it literally means. Taj al-Urus is one of the, you can say, mothers in Arabic language when it comes to, to the Arabic language and dictionary. It's one of the mothers of all the dictionaries. Umm al-Ma'ajim. So, in Taj al-Urus, Urus, when he mentions the definition of anger, he says, huwa thawaran, huwa thawaran dam al-qalb liqasd al-intiqam. Huwa thawaran dam al-qalb liqasd al-intiqam. It is when the blood inside your heart just erupts and rushes. It's the, it's the really heavy flow of blood inside your heart that leads to what? لِقَصْدِ الْإِنْتِقَامِ With the intention of having revenge. This is what anger is linguistically. It's when your blood rushes inside you and you automatically have this, this, this emotion and feeling to quickly take revenge. For example, we can think of many different examples when somebody angers us, you know, we want to react, whether that revenge may be with our words, we want to say something back to them, or that revenge may be with our actions, we want to hit the guy back or whatever it is. This element of intiqam and revenge is there in actual anger. So this is the linguistic meaning of, of ghadab, of anger. So, and this is the prohibition Islam is making. When Islam is saying, la taghdab, do not get angry, they are talking about Islam is talking about this definition of anger. Meaning when you get angry, don't have the intention of going out and seeking revenge on, on that person that hurt you or upset you. Remove that aspect of revenge or reacting in a negative manner. So, Imam Shafi'i rahmatullahi and now there's a question to be asked. Are all types of anger madhmoom and blameworthy? Is all, are all types of anger blameworthy? Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi in his book, Ihya Alum al din in the chapter of Kitabu Dhamm al Ghadab, he speaks about anger. And he breaks anger down to three different types. The first is Tafrit. Tafrit. The second is Ifrat. And the third is I'tidal. Okay, I'll explain each. Now, Tafrit is that type of anger, or Tafrit is basically when a person has no anger whatsoever. You can smack him in the face, you can. Do whatever you want to him, to his family. He's not going to react whatsoever. Okay? Imam Shafi, rahmatullahi alayhi, he says something very funny. He says, Man falam yaghdab fahuwa He says, whoever is provoked to get angry, whoever is provoked, meaning whoever sees, whoever does some type of injustice to somebody else, and he does not feel anything inside him, he does not get upset or angry, then this person is a donkey. He's not a human being. He's not normal. Why? Because you can smack a donkey, you can kick a donkey, you can do whatever you want to a donkey. It's, it's going to react the same way every single time. So tafrit is not good. To be, you know, a person who has no emotion, that's not good. Okay, this is, this, this is a blameworthy type of anger. Then he goes and he says, the second type is ifrat. Ifrat, yani ghulu. It's excessive, too much anger. Meaning, whatever happens to this person, he's going to get angry. Whether it's, you know, he gets cut, cut off on the road, whether it's, you know, he hits his foot on something, he's going to react and get super angry. He's, he's, he's an angry person all the time. No one's going to want to be around him. This is also madhmoom and blameworthy. The third type 
Now this is the type that is praiseworthy. It's i'tidal, having moderation and balance, knowing when to be angry, knowing when to get angry, knowing when to show your anger. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the narration is mentioned in different books of hadith where whenever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam disliked something, the Sahaba said that you could see it in his face. You can see it in his face that there was dislike towards that thing. Whether it was something haram, whether it was other diff different things. Different narrations mention how the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam became, became very, very angry. There's narrations that mention the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam becoming very angry. So some examples I'll mention to you, for, uh, to, to my brothers, to you guys. There was one example where this one person came. He was the imam of this, of this area. And the people, the musallis, who used to pray behind this imam, they came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and they complained. They said, Ya Rasulullah, this imam, he always reads very, very long surahs. And a lot of us are old. A lot of us are old and it's very hard for us to, to, you know, to stand up for that long. The narration mentioned that the Prophet alayhi wa salatu wasalam, the same verb, he got very upset and very angry. He went and spoke to the imam and he told him, look, you cannot be doing this. He didn't go off and blow up and you know blow up on him and just swear at him or do this and that. He used a stern voice and he said, Look, this is incorrect. This is against what I've taught you. Or another example, there was this one Bedouin, and at that time, you know, there was no tissue paper, there was no garbage. Whenever a person had to spit, they used to spit on the ground. So there was this one Bedouin, while you know, being in the masjid, in Masjid Nabawi, he spat on the ground. And not a normal, not a normal type of spit, the one where like you you build up from the throat and so forth. Just let, it, just let it out inside the masjid. The Prophet ﷺ became very angry. He himself, ﷺ, went himself, he actually removed it with him, by himself. He removed it himself and he told him, he rebuked the man. He said, don't ever do this again. This is incorrect. So the Prophet ﷺ, where anger was necessary, he showed anger. Where anger was necessary, he showed anger. He was a person of i'tidal and moderation. This is why he وسلم, the narration is mentioned in Sahih Muslim, he says, The Prophet ﷺ said, I'm a human being. I get mad, I get happy. You know, I get happy just like human beings get happy, and I get mad just like human beings get mad. So the prohibition here is what? The blameworthy type of anger. Don't get angry for no reason. Don't get angry for no reason. And at the same time, when we should get angry, we should show some anger. We should show some, some dislike, some hatred. This concept in Islam of loving something for the sake of Allah and hating something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, the different types of you know, injustice is taking place around the world on different people, on different Muslim people, on different non-Muslims, you know, whether it's them being killed for no reason, the different types of genocide. We should hate that. We should show our anger towards that. We shouldn't be happy towards it. We shouldn't let, us, you know, we shouldn't let, it, let it not affect us. We should be affected by it. So now, there's a narration where the Prophet ﷺ, he mentions the asl and the root of anger. Where, where is anger from? What is anger from? We all know human beings feel it. But who incites it and how is it incited? So the Prophet ﷺ, the hadith mentions, إِنَّ الْغَضَبَ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ Anger is from shaitan. Anger is a tool of shaitan. He's going to try to use this tool to mislead the people. He's going to try to make people overreact when they shouldn't react as much as they should. So when we understand this, when we understand this, it's going to be very easy for us to, to um, you can say, comprehend and control our anger. And I'll get into why and how. There's a narration before I continue on mentioned by Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu. And a man came to him. And again, same thing. They asked Salman al-Farsi. They said, Ya, ya Aba Abdullah, awsini. Give me some advice. And this is going back to the concept we spoke about last week of, of staying silent. So Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu, he advised him with the same thing the Prophet ﷺ advised in this hadith. He said, La taghda. Do not get angry. But this person what's consistently asking, you know, give me more advice. Please give me more advice. 
because I want I'm, 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 I'll be able to take it and learn more from it. So again, it's interesting what he said. He said, "فَإِنْ غَضِبْتَ فَمْلِكْ لِسَانَكَ وَيَدِكَ." When you get angry, when you get angry, take possession and ownership of your hand and your tongue, meaning control your hands and your tongue. Going back to the statement, the great Alim, rahmatullahi alayhi, mentioned, we spoke about how nothing is more worthy of jailing than a person's tongue. Jailing a person's tongue, jailing your tongue, staying silent, practicing this. And how we should practice it, we're going to get into it. But I want to mention some examples where the Prophet, alayhi salatu was salam, you know, was, was able to react in a very angry manner, but he never did. The hadith mentions where um, this one Yahudi came to him and he was telling the Prophet wasallam the signs of the Prophet who was supposed to be coming, the sign of the Prophet, one of the signs being that his forbearance, his patience always precedes his anger. His forbearance and patience always comes before his anger. He doesn't let his anger take control. He always lets his hilm, his forbearance, and his patience take control. So we're, we'll, we'll talk about some few examples now. The example that I always like to talk about in regards to this is the example narrated in Sahih Muslim, where this one Bedouin man came inside Masjid Nabawi. He came to the Masjid, and he went to the corner of Masjid Nabawi, and he started to urinate. He started to urinate. The Sahaba all got up, and they all got so angry, they ran towards this guy, and you know, they were gonna, they were gonna beat him. But the Prophet ﷺ stopped the companions. He said, stop. This man is a Bedouin. He does not know the sanctity of the masjid. So how are you going to, and why are you going to, you know, show anger towards him? He has not even, you know, he doesn't even know the sanctity of the masjid. How can you show anger towards him? Let him finish, go clean that urine, then I'll go talk to him myself. SubhanAllah, this is the adab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or another example, I always talk about how this one Yahudi, with the same narration where it speaks about how the same Yahudi, he said that one of the signs in the Torah mentioned that this prophet, his forbearance always comes before and precedes his anger. This same Yahudi wanted to test the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's a long narration, but basically the narration is that this Yahudi, he went and he, it was to do with dates, and the Prophet ﷺ gave him a deferred payment that he's going to give him dates at this time, at this time, and so forth. And the Yahudi came before that actual time to test the Prophet to see how patient he's going to be. It's a long narration. Anyways, what happened was that this man came, he grabbed the Prophet ﷺ by his collar and he threw him against the wall. He threw the Prophet ﷺ by the collar, grabbed him and just put him against the wall. And he said, where's my money? He asked him, he said, where's my money? The Prophet ﷺ, he smiled. He smiled even though the Prophet ﷺ knew that, you know, I wasn't supposed to give this guy money until, you know, next week. But he came to me thinking that today's the day, it's okay, I'll give him that money. Umar anhu was there. Umar anhu got so angry. He got so angry. He told this guy, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? You're doing this to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, "I'll cut you where you stand." He was about to grab his sword, where the Prophet alaihi wasallam stopped him. He said, "Stop! Give this man his money and give him more." Umar radhiyallahu anhu was shocked. He said, "Ya Rasulullah, you don't even owe this guy anything. You don't owe him that money till next week. Why are you doing this?" But again, the Prophet alaihi wasallam said, "No, I do. Give him the money and give him more because of him being angry, and because of this action." This person became Muslim. This Yahudi, he came to Islam. So akhlaq goes a very, very long way. So now, another example I'm going to share with my, you and my brothers is the incident when Hamza radiallahu anhu was murdered. When Hamza radiallahu anhu was killed. We all know the very famous story where Hamza radiallahu anhu, not only was he killed, but he was mutilated. He was chopped up, he was cut up, his nose was cut off, his ear was cut off. And to understand the, dyna the dynamics of this, Hamza radiallahu anhu was very, very beloved to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa At a time where there weren't too many supporters of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So Hamza radiallahu anhu was that support system that, you know, that, that was not really there. He was the only one there for him. The strongest presence was Hamza radiallahu anhu at that time. 
So when Hamza radiallahu anhu passed away, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam fell very, very sad. He fell into grief to a point where when he came to Medina, when he came to Medina, he started crying himself. And when they asked him, when they, uh, when they asked him, Ya Rasulullah, why are you crying so much? The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, La bawaki halahu. There is nobody to cry for my Hamza. People are crying, you know, people are crying for their family members lost in the battle of Badr and Uhud. And he said to the people, La bawaki halahu. There is nobody to cry for my Hamza radiallahu anhu. And the narration mentioned, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he mentioned the narration, he said, Ma ra'ina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam baki an qattu ashaddu min bukaihi ala Hamza. This narration is mentioned in the Rahik al-Makhtum. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said that I have never seen and we have never seen Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cry so much as he did cry for Hamza radiallahu anhu. So this was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at his, at his loss for Hamza radiallahu anhu. But what happened later on in Islam? When Wahshi and, and, um, and Hind, when they came to, you know, these were, these were the murderers of Hamza radiallahu These were the ones who killed Hamza radiallahu anhu. Wahshi was the one who killed Hamza, but Hind was the one who mutilated Hamza. How did these two react? How did these two react and how did the Prophet ﷺ react when he met them during the conquest of Mecca for them to, uh, during the time the Muslims uh, arrived at Mecca? The Prophet ﷺ accepted their tawbah. The Prophet ﷺ did not seek revenge for them. These two people came to Islam and the Prophet ﷺ forgave what they did to Hamza radiallahu anhu. Think about that. If somebody does that, put yourself in each of these incidents, whether it's a person grabbing you by the collar, throwing you against the wall, whether it's you seeing a person coming right now, for example, urinating in the corner of the masjid, or whether it's dealing with somebody who murdered somebody very, very close to you. How would you react in every single one of these situations? We would react with intiqam and revenge, with anger, with hatred. But the Prophet ﷺ, his hilm, his forbearance always came first. His forbearance and forgiveness always came first. The same incident in Ta'if, the exact same thing that happened when, when he went to Ta'if, when he came, when he went to Ta'if to give da'wah to the people. The people threw so many stones at him. They threw so many rocks at him. But the narration mentions that his sandal, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was there was a puddle of blood inside his sandal. Blood was just gushing from him. And the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, came to the outskirts of Ta'if where he sat in an area, in a garden. Jibreel, alayhi salatu wasalam, came to him. He said, Ya Rasulullah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent me to tell you that if you want right now, these two mountains between Ta'if will destroy these people, will come together and destroy every single one of these people. It's in your command. We will do it right now. The Prophet ﷺ, while being in a state of pain, anguish, grief, you can imagine, I mean, people, you know, they throw so many stones at you, they spit on you, they do this. How much anger should a person be feeling? But the Prophet ﷺ said, no. Perhaps one day, these people will come to Islam. Perhaps one day, somebody in their forefathers, somebody in their lineage will become Muslim. In today's day and age, everybody in Ta'if is a Muslim. This is the Prophet ﷺ's hilm and forbearance. So, these are some examples I wanted to mention. I mean, there's so many examples where the Prophet ﷺ did not react with anger or did not let his anger get a hold of him or whatever it was. Many different examples. But now, the point I want to talk about today is how we can control... First of all, what does anger lead to? There's so many different negative effects of, of anger. I was reading a few different articles, different research, different studies done by different universities around the world. How anger... You know, I'll mention some, some of the things I found. One that, you know, anger, a person who's always angry or when a person gets angry it puts the heart at great risk. It puts the heart at great risk, meaning the chances of getting a heart attack go a lot higher, they increase. Or number two, it's mentioned that there's an in increase factor, there's an increased risk of having a stroke. The risk factor of having a, sh a stroke is increased. Are going on, it, in it weakens the immune system. And when a person's immune system gets weak, it's not able to fight against the different diseases that attack the body. Or continuing on, it worsens anxiety. Going on, it's linked to depression. And on top of that, I found a very interesting uh, 
a very interesting article written written by a few Harvard students and their professor. They did a research that's that was based on um, to see if anger can harm a person's lungs. And subhanAllah, they did a, a study where they studied 670 men over eight years using a hostility scare, scale scoring method to measure, to measure anger levels and assess any changes in the men's lung function. And then they found that the men with the highest hostility ratings had significantly worse lung capacity. So I mean, it even affects your lungs, so then which increased their risk of respiratory problems. So I mean, and on top of that, I mean, based on all of this, it also shortens a person's lifespan. So anger has nothing but negative effects, especially for a person who gets angry for no reason all the time. So now, and this is aside from all the spiritual, from all the spiritual effects it brings. Obviously, from the spiritual effects, it can bring hatred. And as we know, hatred, just, hatred consumes the heart. It's something that corrupts the heart. And if a person can't control their anger, what happens is that, you know, relationships will be cut off for no reason sometimes. Or sometimes a man will divorce his wife just out of a fit of anger. And, you know, there's an ikhtilaf between the ulama. You know, there's almost all the ulama, they say that a divorce will take place during a fit of anger. There's some people that like to say that, oh, no, anger is anger. You know, anger is something that prevents divorce or when a person does go out with a divorce during anger, it's not going to be considered. But this is a very minority opinion. The majority of ulama say no. The, more, the majority of ulama say no. They should, the person should control their anger. Anger is not a means, you know, anger is not a type of insanity where you don't know what you're doing. But we'll get into that as well, inshallah ta'ala. So, nothing comes from it except negative, except negativity. Now, how do you control your anger? This is a question that you know, we all have, and we all should have. So the Prophet والسلام, he mentioned many different things. But before we get into actually controlling your anger while being in a fit of anger, I wanted to talk about how we can prevent it altogether. How we can prevent being angry at all, you know, at completely, rather than falling into it and then talking about the solutions. How to prevent it. So... The first solution to every problem in life is recognizing that there is a problem. Okay, recognizing that there is a problem. We have to be very critical of ourselves. You know, we should not be critiquing others. We should first be critiquing ourselves, looking at ourselves, noticing the faults, admitting to the faults, admitting to ourselves that we have these faults. This is the first solution to taking control of any, any of, of you know, coming to any conclusion with anything you're going through in life, admitting there's a problem. Okay, so now, the first key to preventing anger, preventing a whatsoever is, the universal key to everything, dua. Dua is something that, you know, and this is the thing, not, to make, not only to make dua while you're angry, but to make dua in times when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to make dua. Times where dua is accepted. Making dua specifically during those times, Ya Allah, help me with controlling my anger. How many, how many of us during those times actually make dua? We all make dua, alhamdulillah. But how many of us actually make dua during those designated times where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have said that duas are accepted? There's a difference. So going to those awqat, going toward to, uh, to those timings and making dua at that time for specific needs. This is very important. The second thing, to, you know, as, a, as a, pre a preventative measure, remembering that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He forgives everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives everything. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to forgive everything, who are we to hold grudges and get angry at people? Who are we to hold grudges and get angry at people when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who forgives? Forgiveness is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if Allah is able to forgive, we should be able to forgive as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His capacity to forgive is much, much greater than ours. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His capacity to forgive is much greater than ours. We hear all the different types of stories where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven. He's forgiven murderers. He's forgiven people who've, who've done injustice. He's forgiven people, different types of people. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to forgive all of that, who are we to hold grudges for small minor things? 
So the third thing, it's kind of connected to the first where I mentioned dua. The third is reciting the proper duas. The Prophet والسلام, he has given us specific duas at specific times. He has given us specific duas to be recited at specific times. For example, one example, the Prophet والسلام, a beautiful dua that's mentioned in the Muslim of Imam Ahmad, he says, Allahumma inni as'aluka kalimat al haqqi fil ghadabi wa rida. Allahumma inni as'aluka kalimat al haqqi fil ghadabi wa rida. Oh Allah, I ask you to give me the ability to speak haqq, to speak haqq in cases when I'm angry and in cases when I'm happy. This is a dua the Prophet Ali Muslim always used to make. And on top of that, whenever we enter the house saying Bismillah and saying Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is something that hadith mentions that shaitan runs away. Shaitan leaves the house whenever a person enters their house saying these duas. And anger is from what? It's from shaitan. So are we actually, you know, alhamdulillah, we all make dua. But are we actually making dua and reciting the right duas at the right time? And making duas at the right time? This is a question to ask ourselves. So the fourth, the fourth going back to that, the last hadith we spoke about is practicing silence. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the hadith is mentioned in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad again. He says, "Ida ghadiba ahadukum fal yasqut." Qalaha thalath. He says, "Whenever you get angry, close your mouth. Don't speak. Don't say anything. Jail your tongue." And one thing we have to do, my brothers and sisters, we have to practice these things. We have to practice. We can't just, you know, expect when we get angry to automatically to try to, you know, to for this to automatically happen, we're expecting it to automatically happen. That's not the case. Practicing silence. Practicing silence before these actual fits come upon us. How do you practice silence? All of us, you know, we all have a social life. We all speak. You know, we all have friends we talk to. Try to limit that. Try to control the things you say. Or when you do talk, Try not to talk too much and give like extra detail and this and that. Control your words. Try not to be excessive when you speak. Speak, speak as much as is, as is needed. Speak as much as the message is, the, the message should be conveyed. Don't talk too much. But this is something that's going to help us when we do get angry. We'll be able to control that and stay silent. So another thing that I mean... It's such a Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi, he mentions this in his Ihya Ulum al He says, meditating ideas and constantly reminding yourself. Meditating ideas and constantly reminding yourself. This is something that the concept of muraqaba. Muraqaba, when you're sitting down, no one's around you, you have no distractions, and you're just you're just monitoring your heart. Monitoring what goes inside your heart. Critiquing yourself, critiquing your different faults, thinking about solutions in your mind while no one's around. This is very, very important that we must do, my brothers and sisters. Reminding yourself, for example, the Prophet والسلام, in regards to anger, what did he say? Another thing he said was, لَيْسَ الشَّدِيدُ بِالسُرْعَةِ إِنَّمَا الشَّدِيدُ الَّذِي يَمْلِكُ نَفْسَهُ عِنْدَ الْغَضَبِ He says, لَيْسَ بِالسُرْعَةِ a strong person, you know, the strong and, you know, very tough person is not a person who can take the next person off to take the person to the ground and wrestle them to the ground. That is not the definition of a strong person. In the mashadid, the strong person is who? الَّذِي يَمْلِكُ نَفْسَهُ عِنْدَ الغضب, The one who controls himself at the time of anger. When anger befalls him, when he gets angry, he controls himself. That is a strong person. So reminding yourself when you're alone that, hey, getting angry, it's a sign of weakness. It is not a sign of strength. Telling yourself this, constantly reminding yourself, meditating ideas. Mentioning the adhkar, mentioning what Rasulullah said about these things. Are we doing this? Or are we only doing this when we come to lectures? Are we only doing this when somebody else is telling us? My brothers and sisters, one thing we have to remember, our criticism, the criticism of ourselves, the critiquing of ourselves, goes much further, goes much, has more of an effect when someone else critiques us. 
Why? Because that is the pinnacle of sincerity. No one else is there to hear you saying anything about yourself. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only witness to you, you know, basically admitting that there is a fault. We have to get into that habit of this. Admitting there's a problem. Admitting there's a problem. And reminding yourself that, you're reminding yourself that hey, the Prophet ﷺ said this about this. In the example of anger, the Prophet ﷺ said that, look, an angry person is a weak person. I cannot be weak. I got to be strong. Telling yourself this. Telling yourself this. It's like, you know, when you go to the gym, the first time you go to the gym, when the first time you're bench pressing, <laughs> you can't lift two three, two, three plates at one time. The first time you go to the gym, it's very heavy. You can't do it. You slowly but steadily progress. You're working yourself out. The more you work out, the stronger you get. Like so, the nafs is the same thing. The soul is the same thing. The more you work it out, the more, the more you work it out, the more you can say, the, heavy, the more heavy lifting you do with your nafs, the more you feed it with these different things. The Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, the stronger your nafs is going to be against these different things. So this is a point I wanted to really emphasize, meditating ideas. Something that we have to do, my brothers and sisters. Very important. So now, and the sixth and final preventative measure, dhikr. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's this narration mentioned in, where he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he saw two men fighting. And it's, this narration is mentioned in the, in the Sahihain. He saw two people fighting and he went to these people he said, should I not tell you something that if you say it, it's going to make your anger go away? And these people said, yes, please tell us. The Prophet ﷺ said, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem. Saying, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem. Okay? So this is something we're going to come back to. Because this is something that we do when we get angry. So now, specifically with dhikr, what is the result of dhikr? What is the conclusion of dhikr? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah bi dhikrillah, tatba in al The more you do dhikr, the more you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's going to bring contentment and peace to the heart. So now, going back to the definition of what anger is. What is anger? Anger is that rush of blood from within the heart. The root is the heart. In another hadith, the Prophet said that anger is a burning coal inside the heart. Anger is a burning coal inside the heart. He a jamaratun. It's an anger, it's, it's a burning coal. So if we do dhikr, we are bringing peace to the asl and the root of where anger is started. So the more we do dhikr, the more control we're going to have of it when it occurs upon us. Does that make sense? So now while being angry, now we spoke about the preventative measures. What do we do when we get angry? So going back to what I just said a few moments ago, the Prophet ﷺ said, when you get angry, you should say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem. What this does is it repels shaitan away. It repels shaitan away. And shaitan is the asl of anger. Anger is from shaitan. So when we do this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy for us to control our anger because shaitan's not there anymore. So right when you get angry, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar Rajeem. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar Rajeem. Saying this, it's a type of dhikr as well. And it's a dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has, has mentioned. The second, staying silent. Right after you say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem, again, it's the, the preventative measures should prepare us for these things. Controlling what you say. Do not react in a way that's going to harm the person. Whether it's through your words or through physical actions. It's better to, st to say nothing. Don't say anything, just take it. Okay? The third, change your posture or change your environment. There's a hadith, there's a few hadith that mention that when a person gets angry, when he is standing up, he or she should, should, uh, should sit down. If they are sitting down, he or she should lay down. Changing your posture and leaving that environment that got you angry. When you're, getting, when you're in an argument with somebody, leaving that area, getting away from that person. There's an example where Ali radiallahu anhu and Fatima radiallahu anhu, they once got into a small argument. So the Prophet ﷺ came to the house of Fatima anha, and he asked, he said, Ya Fatima, where is Ali? And Fatima anha answers, Ya Rasulullah, something, something happened between us. 
we had a small little feud, small little argument. The Prophet Ali got a bit upset at Fatima. Anyways, what happened was that the Prophet commanded everybody to find Ali. So where is Ali? Ali what happened was that he was not in the house where he got into that argument. He left the house. So leaving your environment. So when they started searching for Ali, they ended up finding him inside the masjid. He was sleeping. So when the Prophet saw Ali, he became very happy. So what did Ali do? He left that place or that environment where anger started and he laid down somewhere. So leaving the environment, extracting, extracting yourself and removing yourself from that environment. Everybody is able to do that. Everybody has control over that. Don't stay there and just continuously argue, 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 you know, go back and forth, go back and forth. Nothing's good, nothing good is going to come from that. Leave the environment. So the fourth, the Prophet ﷺ in different hadith, the same hadith where he says that anger is from shaitan. And he goes and he says, وَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ مِنَ النَّارِ Shaitan is made from fire. So what a person should do, he should extinguish that fire with water. Extinguish that fire with water. So one, some narrations, they say that person should actually go and make wudu. Other narrations mention that that person should, should go and make ghusl. Other narrations mention that that person should go and drink some water. Cool yourself down. When you get angry, the temperature of your body rises. When you get angry, the temperature of your body rises. So what water does, it cools, your in, it cools the interior of your, of your body down. So drink water as well. So these are some... Some things that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. But the key here, my brothers and sisters, patience is key here. Patience, subhanAllah, is, is the cure, is a, is a cure for many, many different types of ailments. Whatever it may be. The poet says, he says, Al-Hilmu murrun madaqatuhu. And he says, Lakinna akhirahu ahla min al-asali. He says, patience and forbearance is something very bitter. It tastes very, very bitter. It's something very, very hard to do. However, akhirahu, the end of patience, the outcome of patience, the light at the end of the tunnel is something very, very sweet. It's something very, very sweet. And the Prophet ﷺ, in another hadith, he says, إِنَّمَا الصَّبْرُ عِنْدَ الصَّدْمَةِ الْأُولَى Patience is what? Patience is, true patience is right when the calamity befalls you. In the beginning having control of it from the beginning if you have control of something from the beginning it's going to be very easy to control it down the line as well taking control of it right when it happens to you right when you get that feeling putting a lid on it and now this concept of putting a lid on it goes to the ayah where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the qualities of the muhsinin the qualities of those people who have ihsan he says Kadhimin Kadhim literally So the verb Kadhuma means to withhold something However the literal meaning of Kadhim It means to lid something up To seal something So sealing your anger up Right when you get that feeling Putting a lid on it Closing it Not letting it out whatsoever Then what's the next quality after that? They forgive people they forgive people. And in Surah Al-Shura, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He specifically mentions this, talking about the believers. He says, وَإِذَا مَا غَضِبُوا When they get angry, هُمْ يَغْفِرُونَ They forgive. وَإِذَا مَا غَضِبُوا هُمْ يَغْفِرُونَ When they get angry, they forgive. They don't hold any grudges. Letting it go immediately. The very famous narration that speaks about the man who the Prophet ﷺ guaranteed him Jannah. This man walked into the masjid, the Prophet والسلام, said, close to the meeting, okay, he said, that person is a man of Jannah. The, the next day, the exact same thing happened. Same man walked into the masjid. The Prophet والسلام, said that that person is a man of Jannah. Third day, the exact same thing. So the, the Sahaba were very confused. So one of these companions, one of these companions, they, they wanted to see what this man was doing that was different than him. So he went... He went, he asked this man, he said, you know, is it okay if I can stay with you for a few days? I don't have, a... he just made an excuse to stay with him to see what he does every single night. So every single night, when this man would go to sleep, he would leave a little bit of space in his blanket so he could see what the guy's doing. 
And this guy would not do anything special. He prayed his Isha, went to sleep, woke up for Fajr. And he, he just followed him the whole day, hovered him. And he noticed that he wasn't doing anything special. So a few days passed, the exact same thing every single day. After a few days, this Sahabi, <laughs> he got tired of it. He said, hey, look, look, I, I've been lying to you this whole time. I've been lying to you this whole time. The reason why I'm here is staying with you is because I want to see what you have been doing with that the Prophet ﷺ said that you have been guaranteed Jannah. You're not praying any extra tahajjud. You're not doing any different uh, extra nafil salawat. You're not doing anything extra. If anything, I'm doing more than you. So what are you doing that, that, that has separated you from the rest of us? And the man was confused himself. He said, I don't know. I don't do anything. I don't do anything. No, the only thing I can think about is that, you know, every single night when I go to sleep, I let go of all the anger inside my heart and I forgive everybody who hurt me that day. And because of, and the, right when he said that, the Sahabi said, that was the action. That was the separating factor between yourself and us. You let go of that anger every single day. You didn't carry those grudges every single day. You made it a means, you made it a thing, a necessity for you to maintain family ties. So this was something that separated this man from the rest. It's forgiveness. Letting go of grudges. In today's day and age, we're living in a day where, I mean, the whole grudges, it's something that, <laughs> it's something that's very common within family as well. Be the first to break that grudge. Be the first to rekindle that relationship. Be the first to apologize, even if you did nothing. You know, my teacher used to give us beautiful advice. He used to say that, look, even if you have done nothing to somebody, even if it's the other person's fault, be the first one to apologize. Be the first one to apologize. Because what that's going to do, that's going to soften that person's heart. Because deep down, that person knows that, you know, you did nothing. Yet you are the first one to apologize. It's showing that, you know, you have humility inside you. And Islam always pushes towards humility. Like we see with the examples of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And the Prophet alayhi wa salatu he was rahmatul lil alameen. I mean, his, his example is, is something that, you know, we can never be obviously, but we can always try to, try to be that way. Trying to be that way, striving towards that. So my brothers and sisters, these are some, I mean, this hadith is very, very comprehensive. There's, there was a lot of things I could have said. But I wanted to share some of the advices of the Prophet ﷺ and how we can control our anger. Keeping these things in mind, my brothers and sisters. I'm going to mention it one more time. The first thing, right when a person gets angry, saying, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem. Ta'awwuf. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem. The second thing, don't say, don't say anything. Stay silent. Don't react. The third thing, drink water. Cool down the interior of your body. Or make wudu. Right? The third thing, leave the environment. Get out of the environment you're in. Don't stay in that environment that made you angry. Stand up and leave. Go lay down. Go sit down. Change your posture. Don't remain in the same argument you're in. Get yourself out of it. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all tawfiq and ability to understand what has been heard and said. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all tawfiq to, to have the type of anger that is of i'tidal. Jazakumullahu khayra wa ahsan. Jazakumullahu khayra wa ahsan. Jazakumullahu khayra wa ahsan. Jazakumullahu khayra wa ahsan. Jazakumullahu khayra wa ahsan.